going to worship the Lord and enjoy His presence. I have a message the Lord gave me today. I think it's going to be interesting to some of us. And I enjoyed putting it together about what we do for the Lord and some comparisons that the Apostle Paul made to different careers as he was recommending to Timothy the way he should conduct himself in ministry. So I think any of us that are looking to do anything for the Lord in a ministerial capacity, whether it be ministry of reconciliation or full-time ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, ministry of helps, it applies to all realms. And so it's interesting. I enjoyed preparing it today. I enjoyed looking at it. I saw it yesterday as I read through the scriptures and it stirred in my heart. So over the last couple of days I've been putting it together. So I think it's a word from the Lord for us all. Amen. Why don't we start with prayer? Lord, we are so grateful that you have allowed us to come together into this room tonight. Our purpose in being here is to bring glory to you. You are our heavenly king. You rule and reign over us. We are your subjects, hopefully loyal. And we are lying before you. We're coming and laying low before the throne of God as we bring our offering to you. We humble ourselves before you and we ask for your mercy and your grace. You said we could come here boldly before your throne and so we do so. And with this confidence, we ask for your mercy to be new tonight, fresh in this room. Visit us in your great power. Let your majesty uh, be unfurled in this room. Out of your garments, let the glory of heaven descend upon us. Wrap your presence around us, Lord. Help us to be wrapped up in the glory of God. We want to be caught up in you. We want to be carried away with you. We want to be, Lord, blinded to the things of this world and have our eyes open to the things of you. We set our affection on things above. We set our mind on things above right now in this moment. And we give this time to you, Lord. This is your moment. This is your time. Be high and lifted up here with us tonight. We welcome you and we yield to you. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agree with me, say amen, amen. to the Lord. While we stand on our feet, we're going to praise and sing uh, and as far as your activities and the way you want to worship the Lord. That's between you and God. As we say, we have no limitations here. Do whatever the Lord tells you or prompts you to do.
nothing can change you in a world of uncertainty, in a world of vast inconsistencies and insecurities. You're the only stable thing we have. Nothing can stop you in our life. Nothing can separate us from your love. Nothing can snatch us out of your hand.
together to meet with you, for you to be high and lifted up, for us to experience the fullness of your presence. Lord, my request is that the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of us right now.
freshness of heaven here tonight. We accept the fact that you are perfect. And you love us. And you want what is best for us. And you know how to give us the Holy Spirit. Because we are your children. Thank you, Holy One of God, for filling this room with your wonderful presence, the very fragrance of eternity. O oh, ancient of days, be honored in this room tonight. We burn the incense of our songs, our praise before you, hoping it will rise. Get your attention. Oh, that the eyes of the Lord would look There is nothing 
So let us all grow by it tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agree with that prayer, say amen to the Lord. A couple of announcements before we get into the Word. This Saturday we're not having the Journey with Jesus class because the Journey with Jesus class is finished. And uh, I had so much fun doing it. I want to do it again. But it takes up so much time. It took up, you know, like half the year. So it may end up doing it. There's actually interest in another church, another ministry in town that wants me to do the series there. So if so, then we have a chance to relive it. But if not, all of the sessions are recorded and are on video at Church Live Ministries on YouTube. So you're welcome to go back and you want to start thinking about what's coming. We're going to do the Book of Acts. And I'm excited about putting that together and studying the Acts of the Apostles in in harmony with the Pauline letters and all the letters that we're going to interlace in the book of Acts and see when those letters were written and it's going to make a lot more sense to you when you do that you can see the letters 
in perspective of the circumstances that Paul is referring to in the letters about what happens in the book of Acts. So when you see it together, it gives us a lot of insight to help us to, to learn and to grow. Um, somebody asked me, this is off, off subject a little bit, but somebody asked me, uh, no, no one in the room, but someone did ask if we were going to have a Halloween service. And, uh, <laughs> Don't we'll laugh. You know, not everybody understands exactly what Halloween is and where it comes from because different religions, some embrace it and have ideas and they've tried to sanctify it. So I want to give you a little bit, a couple of tidbits here about the history of Halloween. And um, the belief system behind Halloween came from the Druids. And it's very simply this. The priests of ancient Gaul in Britain, the Druids, believed that witches, demons, and spirits of the dead roam the earth on the eve of November 1st. Halloween originally was a Druid holy day called the Vigil of Saman. In early Britain, or Britain, it was called the Festival of Samhain, which is pronounced so in according to this. The festival would last for three days and many people would parade in costumes made from the skins and heads of animals. It was birthed out of fear to placate demons and to uh, do service to them, to pacify them, to not hurt them. And the druids and the witches and warlocks would also claim that they would hurt the people if they didn't give them some reward. From the term trick or treat, that's where it took place. If you, you would either treat them by giving them some offering or they would bring a curse on you, or a trick it was referred to. And so these customs, really there is, in, even in the religious festivals and the Christian religions that tried to embrace the concept of Halloween, they, it, 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 mysteriously, Jesus does not appear. He's been left out of the equation because Jesus has nothing to do, because there's no connection with Jesus and Halloween. So we as Christians just need to make up our own minds. There are a lot of churches that will come up with secondary festivals, family nights and hallelujah night, I heard, is one that they do. And that's well and fine. I, I don't do that kind of thing. You know me. I'm not going to bend over backwards for anything. And I believe in the Word of God. We follow the Bible. We do what the scriptures say. And I cannot reconcile the holiday in any way, shape, or form. And um, I decide to take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, I rebuke and expose them, as it says in 2 Corinthians 4 4. That it's wrong. It's wrong. And, and if you are now, if you're part of some celebration during that, just remember what you're a part of and what you're doing. You're connected to a festival that is dedicated to. Uh, the presence of demon spirits. So uh, you're going to get what you paid for. And a lot of dark and evil things happen on this night. Not in this room, <laughs> but in other places. <laughs> dark and evil. The Holy Spirit is here, so we're, we are not connected in any way to any of these things. But we need to be aware of its origins, its history, and its dangers. And remember that uh, we can be encouraged. Don't let evil get the best of you, but conquer evil by doing good, it says in Romans 12, 21. Just always serve Jesus, always focus on the Lord. And we don't need to be connected to anything. I don't need to, you know, put nits about it. It's just, it's just that simple. If you're a student of the Word of God and you do things, you know, I had a revelation. It was very interesting. My wife and I were having coffee and we were praying together and talking together. And you know what maturity in the Word gives you? And, and I'm not saying that I've attained some great maturity, but in 30 years I have been full time studying the Bible. And I'm just starting to gain more. And you know, it's something I realized today. It's not so much, maturity in the Word is not so much knowing what the Bible says as it is knowing what the Bible does not say. Think about that very carefully. That it's, you know what the Bible says, but it's impossible to know everything the Bible says in spiritual implication. You can maybe memorize the scriptures, but it's so much. But Maturity in the Word, if you have enough of the Word tempering your existence in your mind, your mind is washed in the water of the Word, the greatest value is knowing what it doesn't say. That way, when any counterfeit thought comes along, you know immediately that's not biblical. Right. You just have a feeling immediately that that's not nothing. When you hear the information, you know that in your, in your computer, where you've been feeding yourself the Word of God, and the more you do this, the better. You look through the archives of the files, the biblical passages, and you realize there is no match to that thought or that idea, so therefore you exclude it. That's just a simple revelation the Lord gave me today, and he told me that that's, uh, my biblical maturity comes more from that. 
And yes, we know things, we're learning things, and I'm surprised all the time at what I see that I've never seen before in the Bible, in spite of the thousands upon thousands of messages that I've preached in these years, it's, it's exciting to see. So anyway, let's turn to the Word now and see what the Lord gave us tonight. The title of this message is, What We Are for Jesus. And these are reflections on the words of Paul. I use the word reflections because you're going to see why in a moment something that Paul tells us. So let's start by reading the entirety of this passage that we're going to see tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1-7. through 7. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We know he's talking to Timothy because the letter is addressed to Timothy. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust the reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. And that last little verse to me was like the fishing lure on the end of the line thrown out. When I saw those words, I began to reflect. So Paul tells us, reflect on what I am saying. And he's saying this to Timothy. For the Lord will give you insight into all this. When I read that, I said, okay, I will reflect on it and look for insight. And sure enough, this is exactly what I decided to do in the preparation of this message. I began to reflect on the words that we just read and a pattern emerged that forms this teaching. So let's break down the passage and see what our reflecting can show us. Let's begin. We're going to see an introduction. The first parts of the verses, verse 1, 2 Timothy 2, 1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And I was considering this. By calling Timothy his son, we see the dedication and love of a mentor with his disciple. You know that he was not biologically his son. But there is a relationship that goes beyond the blood relationship of family. And that is the relationship of mentors and disciples. We have extensively learned that this strategy is the timeless way that God has developed his children through the centuries. That we have Father God, but God gives us people to help us to learn. You know my story, my seven major mentors that I've had, and all the minor mentors. And God brought me through a succession of individuals that have contributed to me, to make me what I am. For me to learn from them, and spiritual fathers in my life that have helped to develop me. And... Timothy had this relationship with Paul, and Paul was helping him, and that's why he referred to him as his son. He's telling him to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, specifically in the category of what Timothy was doing for a living. Timothy was, was not uh, a potter. Timothy was not a carpenter. Timothy was a minister of the gospel. He had been left by Paul after training him for years, left to do the work of the ministry in an administrative capacity, but in a spiritual capacity to train men in cities that Paul had started churches in. So he was in full-time ministry. So as we see this, I want us to consider that to temper how we receive the words. We can only reach our full expression as his ministers via this process. If you do not see your mentor as a father in your life, that you're not yet yielded to the process. You may still have yet to find your true mentors. Don't give up searching. Now, not everyone that you meet is going to be like your father, and you're going to say, I don't need a father anymore. I have found this guy or this spiritual mother, which, by the way, I could easily say you can have spiritual fathers and you can have spiritual mothers. And a spiritual mother can be as, if not more important, than having a spiritual father. And I know some great ministers that are out there shaking the world for Jesus that were not mentored by men at all, but they were mentored by spiritual mothers. And they became great things. Some of my greatest mentors were female. You've often heard me talk about Ruth Ann Martinez and, and her granddaughter came here to the program. And that was a spiritual mentor of mine that imparted really <coughs> virtually all of the faith that I walk in came from me watching her operate in realms of faith that defied human imagination. 
seeing miraculous things in their ministry with the Lord showed me. So men, women, fathers, mothers, mentors that are in our life, don't give up searching if you haven't found a connection. And I'm not saying, I, see, I cannot make someone connect to me. God gives me some disciples, and sometimes people just come to glean from my ministry. I will never be one to come to you and say, I am your father. You know, like, like Darth Vader revealing his true identity to Luke Skywalker. You know, I'm not going to come to you and tell you that. And also, I'm not going to respond to someone coming to me asking me to be their father. I had a guy one time come to me and say, I just need you to be my daddy. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa back off. That's kind of creepy. I said, I just, I don't know if I can do exactly what you're looking for. But if we walk together, let's see what God has to do. Because that kind of relationship cannot be established by man, not by choice. It is supernatural. God brings mentors and people together with their disciples. And that connect takes place spiritually. And you can identify them as a type of father or mother or mentor. But, but without this, I truly believe that we're not going to be able to make it in what God has for our future. It continues in the second verse of 2 Timothy. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. And in, in, the, in the presence of many witnesses means that as Timothy was going around with Paul, Paul was saying things repetitiously that Timothy had ingrained in him because of his time with him. If you spend any time with a mentor long enough, you're going to hear the same things again and again. Every time they stand with a new person, you're going to hear them say everything that you've already heard. Yeah, I know that, I know that, I know that. And it's going to be laid again on the foundation that's already in you because every mentor that is capacitated by God is going to only carry a finite amount of information that was given to him to pass on to other people. You've heard me relate it to a treasure chest. That every one of us has this chest or this box full of gifts and teachings. The, the scriptures call it like a, a house owner, a religious teacher is like a homeowner. He has old and new treasures. We are containers of revelations very specific to us that we pass on and people receive it. Paul had this. Paul commissioned Timothy to convey the same principles that he had taught him to others so that the process would be perpetuated throughout time. In other words, he was not in it just to have a good spiritual time, but Paul had a master plan of procreation of faith that had to be in line, and he was not going to let Timothy not walk in the same principle. And you see the same warnings given to Titus as well. That his disciples were commissioned to make disciples and have those people make disciples. There was a discipleship mentor relationship that was very clear in the teachings of Paul. So we need to be sure that we are a part of this process. I firmly believe that if we are not a part of this system, we are not truly a part of the kingdom of God. I know that seems like strong words. Well, I've never really had a mentor. I've never been connected. Well, then you're missing a vast part of what God wants you to have. Now, as we go on into the scripture, this is just in preface to that. Now, we see three things in the passage that Paul compares us to as followers of Christ while we walk through this mentor-discipleship relationship that God has given us. Each of these things are roles that men take in life that best emulate the life of an obedient child of God. And if you saw when we read through them, there's three different types of people that the scripture mentions. Each of these analogies show us an important key to the success of the ministry of Christ. This is what Paul wanted Timothy to discover and live. This is why he said, reflect on this. Meaning, go back, don't take it just simply for what you see there, but consider each of these in a way of reflection that will cause you to receive information or direction about how to live your life for Christ. And that's what Paul wanted. We're going to do the same with this message as we go on. So we see what we are for Jesus. Three comparisons. And number one is we are soldiers. That's where he starts off saying this. And it says there in verses 3 and 4. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. You know, I've often admired the Salvation Army. 
because, you know, they, besides having cool little uniforms, they, they have a structure and an order. And the more I live in Christ, and as I'm, I'm really, my ministry hasn't even started yet. I'm preparing. This has all been school for me over the last 30 years. When I'm 50, I believe God is going to cause me to understand some things. And in fact, I knew that because he's told me that. So I still have another four and a half years to go before. And so right now, you are walking with me through an adolescence or a developmental stage of my life to where real ministry can come in the future. Hopefully, we'll all be a part of that. I hope when God grants me the true structure that he wants me to have and give and do and teach and, and pass to create the kind of ministry he has for us to do, I hope that we are a part of it together. I hope it can serve you. For now, I know the principles he's given me. I can only teach what I know, and I do that. But I, as I'm growing here and seeing, I'm seeing more and more the need to have the kind of almost militaristic structure to a group of leaders. Not, not in the sense of, you know, commanding, and, but that there be a, an understanding. I have conflicts between my missionaries. I have conflicts about who's who and what and who needs to listen to who and they're not the boss of me and they said, but I don't listen to them. I listen, wah, 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 wah. And I almost have to, and I feel like going in and saying, okay, this is, this is the ranking. This is a general, this is a colonel, this is a corporal. This, I, I almost feel like granting these, these, I've never, I've always shied away from that. But I'm afraid that I may end up having to create some type of a ranking so that we can stop some of the foolish conflicts that are between people, that they understand. Really, it's a simple process. Just ask yourself about seniority. Ask yourself about the price that people have paid. Consider who's paid the price the longest and who's invested the most into the kingdom, and you should respect that is really technically what the word elder means in the Bible, someone who has lived longer. That's the only reason I have anything to offer to people in teaching is because of the years of experience I have in ministry. I can speak out of that experience. I don't have to lord it over anyone. I can just say, look, this is all the times I screwed up and failed. Don't do that. And that's a good example. That's probably the most valuable lessons I have are the things that I did wrong so that you can avoid those pitfalls. But here Paul is teaching, let's get back to this, talking about a soldier, military system. Now the first comparison that Paul gives us is that of a good soldier. Consider the definition of soldier that Paul carried in his mind. He was a Roman citizen, and that was his mental image of a soldier. So Paul often used this comparison and all of its implications to paint a picture of the believer walking in obedience to Christ. And, and in a moment, we're going to look at this passage, but for now, I want us to think about this. See, Paul, as a Roman citizen, which he was, he knew military his whole life there was a Roman-controlled government around him. By the time he was born, to the time he died, Rome and, and the power of the Roman forces was there. When you said soldier, that's what there was. When he's talking about a soldier, he's talking about a Roman soldier. Maybe you've seen movies, you've seen uh, maybe a Gladiator or some of these films where they have pieced together the full uniform of a Roman soldier, and actually it's extremely accurate that they've done it because there are literal statues available that show you the exact armor of the Roman soldier, and there are actual leftover shields and spears and swords and true armor left, and we, we have it. There's no conjecture involved. We have facts. So I know exactly what Paul pictured in his mind because I can see it. If you go back to some of these movies, you can see it in your head too. You know, with the big toilet brush on the top, the thing, the, the scrub things with their head. And you, but you have images that you get, the, the metal, you know, the chest with the little bronze nipples on there and stuff, you know, those weird things, the abdominal plate with the levels and, you know, no matter what your stomach looked like, you could put that on and look pretty buff. And I almost wish I had one, it'd be pretty cool. Go to the beach with it. <laughs> but anyway, surely I digress. So now let's look at a famous passage. Ephesians, this is written by Paul to the church at Ephesus. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now, I'm going to skip down to verse 14, but already know that when he says armor, he means Roman soldier's armor. 
And to prove it, he delineates that armor and shows us some, some serious things here. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Now, let's go to the next frame. It says here, preparedness is the key to being a good soldier. There in each one of these men or people in careers that Paul is comparing, I'm going to show you three keys, one from each. They all start with the letter P, and this is really what it's going to show us. In my gleaning, in my reflection, I see this is what Paul was trying to tell Timothy. That like a soldier, you need to have preparedness. You need to be ready. Be prepared. I believe that the main idea that Paul was trying to show his disciple was that of being ready at all times, being prepared for everything. In another passage, what does he tell him? He even says, study to show yourself approval, work, but not be ashamed. Be prepared. Be ready. Get ready for, for what's coming in the future. A Roman soldier, like most soldiers today, was trained and prepared for his task. The more training and preparation, the more skilled the soldier becomes and the less likely to be defeated. And I write the note, this special force is trained for thousands of hours at the cost of millions of dollars before they ever are used in action. The governments of the world can put a price tag on their elite forces. You can take a U.S. Navy SEAL and calculate actually how many millions of dollars, and it costs millions, to create one Navy SEAL. Do you know that one Navy SEAL costs millions of dollars to train that one person because of the extensive training they have to go through to be prepared. And the more prepared they are, the more likely that they will gain the upper hand in a conflict or a battle. Why? Because they've already played out those scenarios in fake little houses and towns built in Utah, and they've run down streets in deserts, and they have it reproduced Kandahar and they've made these, these villages, these whole cities to be exactly like that in the Middle East and that in Europe and these places. And they've done drills for months on end at 12 hours a day, reproducing certain schemes or tactics again and again and again, failing hundreds of times and redoing it till they got it right. You understand? That's the process of developing a soldier. Paul's telling us, if you consider yourself to be a disciple, if you consider yourself to be in training in the kingdom of God, to be able to do the work that God's called you to do, if you're serious about representing Jesus, then you're a soldier. And that means you need to be prepared. And the only way that you can be prepared is repetition of action. Again and again and again. Every church service I do, I'm being more prepared. I told you a moment ago that I'm just getting started. I haven't even really started yet my ministry. In the words of Danny Asa told his daughter, Ruth Ann, if you stay faithful to the things God's called you to do, after 30 years, you'll have a ministry. From his view, as one of the greatest men of God I've ever known, it takes 30 years for someone to even have what he called a ministry. No, not just, you know, a year and a half of Bible school and you're the greatest, you know, the Reinhardt Bunky steps out there, ready to go. No, it takes years and years and years. Just like a really well-trained soldier, they don't train in boot camp and just throw them out there. They do when they want them to be cannon fodder, like in the Second World War. Basically, they just needed a body to block bullets so that other bodies could make it a little further, and then that body blocked more bullets, and you saw the films like Saving Private Ryan, some horrific images of World War military tactics. Now we sit in air-conditioned trailers and push buttons on a computer screen with a robot helicopter that flies over and can shoot 18 people with one shot in hiding in different corners. You see some of the new technology they have. Things are changing, but still the soldiers have to be prepared and go through methodical, systematic training. To me, I have found that my preparation through the years has been through constant services, church planting, 
this, what we're doing right now, coming together into a room within a two-hour period and doing worship to get us into the presence of the Lord, putting together teachings. You know how many of these teachings I've put together? Thousands. That is preparing me. I'm trained like special forces minister of the gospel. Through the years, I'm getting better and better and better and better and better what I do. You think, well, you know, I just want the Lord to anoint me. That's great. I hope he does. Praise God. Bless your darling little Jesus heart with his anointing. But it's a lot more than just the anointing. The anointing breaks the yoke. The anointing is important, but the anointing is not going to be able to manifest through you if you're not prepared, if you're not trained, if you've not gone through the painstaking process of becoming something. This is what I got when I reflected on what Paul was, I believe, trying to tell Timothy. How many of you can see it? Prepare, prepare, ready to go. We can break down that passage as, as we see it in the, in the scripture. Look what it says in the next one. Seven elements of preparedness. I'm not going to teach this at length. You can just kind of take a glance at it. This is what the elements are. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. I have underlined truth, righteousness, readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Faith that defends you. And the Roman shield that he's talking about was as big as a door. The thing was this tall. They carried it on the side. Of the, it was big enough that they could stick it like this and just literally squat down that much and they were behind an impenetrable barrier. And when the flaming darts, the, the arrows with, with bindings of cloth soaked in, in uh, petroleum shot at them with flames would hit. This thing was big enough and it was soaked with water. The shields would be soaked with water in a time of war to absorb and quench the fire that were coming at them. They would just hide behind them and just sit there and talk about the weather while the enemy used up all their arrows. And then when they were ready, they would just get up and march on. They, and when they would be in their onslaught, they'd just hide behind them. Very wise. That's why the Romans conquered the then known world because they had tactics and ideas. That's what faith gives to us. And I'm not doing a teaching on this right now. I'm just showing you the helmet of salvation. That is the fact that we're saying wash in the blood it covers our mind, our imagination, all of our thoughts. We're able, because of what Jesus has done for us, to take captive every vain imagination, everything that exalts itself against God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, their sword was powerful. They had a small sword and they had a big sword. Some people have big Bibles and little Bibles. <laughs> if I remember a brother, one of my mentors, um, uh, Norman Richmond, my first mentor, he would keep a little Gideon Bible in his pocket. He called it his pocket knife. <laughs> he said, see, brother, that's my pocket knife. I keep it right here. And we would go places and sure enough, somebody would have a question. He'd pull, let me just look. Oh, look what I got here. And he'd pull out that little Bible and open it. Of course, now we have iPhones. So we have the Bible immediately available in our smartphones. And we see, pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Now, some people think that this means to only pray in tongues. And when they see this, they immediately think, oh, then I need to pray in tongues all the time. The praying in the Spirit can mean more than just praying in tongues. It could be mean praying in the anointing. Pray when the Spirit of the Lord moves you to pray. When you feel the unction of the Spirit. Be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints, he tells them. This is all part of your preparedness. You're prepared when you know the truth. You have righteousness. Your readiness comes from the gospel of peace. Those who went through the journey of Jesus, you have grown a lot because of it. You've grown in your knowledge of the story of Jesus Christ more than you know. And when you have next opportunity, or maybe you've had that, somebody literally asks you, so tell me the story of Jesus. You're going to have it. You're going to be surprised at how well you will be able to recite the story of Jesus. And my little shenanigans up here will come back to your mind. Some of the jokes we made, the things we did, because we went through it exhaustively. It's in your head. Don't worry. It will come to life when you need it. That's you having the sword of the Spirit. Preparedness. The more you go through that, the better. Don't miss those classes. Some people think it's extracurricular. No, it is curricular. For those that are serious, that Saturday morning is probably the most powerful thing that I have done in Singapore. I would say, no, I'm going to conclusively say, Journey with Jesus is the most useful and most powerful and most anointed thing I have accomplished in the nation of Singapore thus far. And therefore, if you did not have part in it, I, you, there it is on YouTube. 
Just take, you know, a few hundred hours of your life and dedicate it to going through all those spots. There are literally hundreds of hours by the time, I don't know exactly, I have to calculate an exact hour figure. Ben, man, I think you guys can calculate all this. They have all the five, they're the one that did all the posting, so roughly at least tell us so how many, we can see how many minutes we have together there. But we know this. Now let's go to the next one. For the sake of time, we're not going to linger any longer. We know that we're soldiers, but number two, we are athletes. Somehow I always think of athlete's foot when I see the word athletes. <laughs> I, I've never had athlete's foot, but my brother did, and my father did, and, and neither, uh, neither of them were athletic. So I didn't get the connection. I'm the athletic one in my family, and I've never had it. I'm almost kind of jealous. It seems like if I were a real athlete, I would have athlete's foot. But I've never, I've never had athlete's foot. But anyway, let's look at what the scripture says. Same passage out of 2 Timothy 2, verse 5. Now, similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the vicar's crown unless he competes according to the rules. So he does not get the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. But now we're concentrating on the fact that he said athlete. Similarly, meaning in the same way that he looked at a soldier for us, he now also is looking at an athlete and so let's look at Paul's second comparison. Is that of an athlete? We can piece together from the scriptures that Paul had trained as an athlete or at least was interested in the field of athletics. It was a very big part of Roman culture. Once again, if you saw Gladiator, uh, those were athletes. Athletes, like the closest thing you're going to get to uh, that would be UFC or uh, NFL football in the United States of America. You know, when we, when we watch soccer or what you call football, we kind of giggle at it because we have football. When we say football, we think NFL. Or, you know, you can tell ex-NFL players because they have canes and wheelchairs. That's how rough that sport. Seriously, you can meet them. You can see any, I saw old NFL players retired in my country, and almost all of them have a cane or something because their bodies were destroyed through the process. Yeah, they made, you know, 50, 60 million dollars in a period of uh, 10 years, but they're... They're, they're reduced to very little afterward. And that's with the best medical care and all that they can do, but it's a rough sport. But it's not as rough as the kind of sports that were going on in Rome when Paul wrote this. Gladiators were, were serious. They, 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 you, you know the they were slaves, of course, it was a life and death issue. But the same training was given to the Roman soldiers, but also to the athletes. And athletes were not all slaves. Some of them were private citizens. And many were involved, much like today we have gymnasiums and health clubs, Rome also was commonly in the development of their physical bodies. They would do this because of the same reasons that many of us do it today, because of sexual perversion. Because Romans were decadent and there was a lot of sexuality and perverse activity between people that were part of orgies and they wanted to look good naked, so they went to the gym. Now I'm not saying Paul did that, but all people were involved because just like it is now, did you ever hear somebody tell you, oh, I went to the gym today, and you're kind of embarrassed to say you didn't? Or if you don't work out or do any exercise, when they start talking about exercise, you feel kind of guilty, oh, you know, I haven't had a chance to get to, almost like it's a prerequisite to being a human being that you make it to a gym. I like what uh, one comedian was uh, I really enjoy Jim Gaffigan is his name. He was talking about going to the health club. And he says, can you believe these people in the health club? They're all this snorting and heavy breathing. So those are the stupid people that make us have to wipe the equipment off. He was mad at people sweating in the health club because his perspective was you just go to the health club. Just walking in there by osmosis, you get healthy. Just <laughs> walking around. And you see those people in the gymnasium. That's not the kind of athlete that we're talking about right now. We're talking about people that really did train. Somebody said I was burnt a little while ago. My friend Johanna, she said, you're burnt. Meaning, quemado, they say in Spanish, because of the tan. Well, it's only because I've been training. I'm so happy to be training. Uh, Stephen said a little while you're getting thinner. Yeah, that's part of my training. I wasn't able to do it for a while, but I'm back in training. Uh, it's what, 30 kilometers in the last two days. I'm running again. I'm having a wonderful time doing it. I'm back on the weights again. I got away from it for a little while because of the summer program. I usually do it during that. But I understand what it means to be an athlete. I enjoy it. I like being strong. I like training. And Paul liked it too, but remember he balanced it with all. He said bodily exercise profits it a little. 
It's more important that you have the spiritual development, but he did use it as an analogy. Now I want us to look at a scripture where it says in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and, and the sin that so easily entangles. You have, a, you have a tangly sin in your life? Throw it off. Just stop it. You have the choice to stop the things that you do. You can do them or not do them. It's, your, it's always going to be your choice. I'm not condemning you. I'm just saying it's a fact. Never say that you have this thing and you cannot stop doing it. No, you can. You can. You can stop doing whatever you want to stop doing. You can start doing whatever you want to stop doing. And when you understand that, that God is not giving you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind, that word means discipline of yourself. You call the shots by your will. If you have something in your life that is entangling you and prohibiting you from being all that you need for God, God can set you free if you are willing to stop it. But God's not going to come along and just stop it for you. Because where's the worship in that? He's going to give you strength and hope and courage, but you call the shots. You decide when to do, what not to do, what to do. And you know the things you're not supposed to be doing. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter, the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. <coughs> So it says there that, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. In other words, Paul is saying, or the writer of Hebrews, which, which is not necessarily Paul, but some say it may be, but the writer of Hebrews said that Jesus saw a goal and he went for it, and it's compared to an athlete in a race. Run with what? With perseverance. Very important. So perseverance is the key to being a good athlete. Endurance training is the most time-consuming part of the athlete's regime. How can you stay doing? You know, people who are real football players, they have to run one hour minimum each day, run without stopping. Now, you ever seen the movie Bend with like Beckham? They say that in that movie, they said, if you, if you can't run for an hour without stopping, you can't be a football player because that's basically what you're doing. Think about it. For one hour, you're running and running, and this is the time you step up there running all the time. Can you run for an hour? I like when I, that's exactly how much I run every day. I love when I go to run on the track, because it's the you know Neon Polytechnic uh, Olympic track. I go on the track, and all these guys come, and they want to run, but they're happy they can run faster than me, because I'm not running super fast. I'm running at a decent pace, but uh, they, are, they run fast, but they do like two laps. Well, you know, I do like 18 laps. And so they'll come and they'll hang with me like two or three laps, and they'll pass me up, but before long, I pass them back up again, where they're going, <laughs> running, because they thought they'd pass up the old gray-headed man, you know. And, and, but, but I'm not looking for a sprint. I'm looking for endurance. I want to be able to stay at the same pace. And, and my pace is so through the years to develop my pace. I'm just thinking like an athlete now to such an extent that there is about a 30 second variation of a one hour time that I run. I, without even checking my watch, I'm about a 30 second margin of my timing from my departure to my return. Exactly. You understand? I'm running almost the identical time each in over one hour period. Because I'm disciplining myself to persevere and have a focus to do that. And this is how I approach all things in my Christian life. Endurance. Perseverance is a learned skill and not an instinct. We must train it into our minds and bodies. Even in the natural realm, it is more about the mind than the body. So it is in the spiritual realm. We need to focus our spiritual energy on enduring this life to the end as faithful servants of Jesus. I think I've shared a story with you before what really got me into uh, doing things, training my physical body. I was driving in a highway in Mexico, this was years ago. I saw this huge cloud of smoke. What I thought was smoke it was actually dust. It was about uh, maybe 60 foot high. Just a big cloud, like, a, like almost like a sandstorm or something. 
And as I was approaching it, still, still, uh, you know, about a third of a kilometer away, I saw at the top of the cloud, I saw something come out of the cloud like this, just up in the air. It was the back end of, of a goods carrier or an 18-wheeler, we call them, you know, Sapan Technicon, they call it in South Africa, the, you know, the big trucks, tractor trailer. It was the back end in the air, airborne, flying up like this through the dust. You know how much it takes to pick up a trailer and throw it in the air. So obviously a cataclysmic event was taking place. I saw that. I, I went up to where the cloud was. As the dust was settling there, I saw thrown off the side of the highway was the tractor trailer mangled and the tractor itself, the truck, upside down and twisted down in a ravine. I pulled over to the side of the road. I was the first person on the scene. Other people saw it too, but I was the first person there. I jumped out of the truck. I told my wife, don't leave the vehicle. Stay here. And I ran down into the ravine, and I climbed on top of the truck and went into the cab where the driver was pinned behind the steering wheel. And he, by the grace of God, was okay. Obviously, some scratches and some broken bones, but pinned. he was pinned behind the steering wheel, and the truck collapsed around him, and he could not get out. So I climbed in there with him, which was on its side. When I climbed into the truck, I was actually standing up in the cab. The cab was on its side. So there was a window here and a window. I was standing on the other window, broken like this, inside the truck. You understand the truck on its side. And here he was behind the steering wheel, locked in there. And I knew I had to get him out when he was going to die. I could hear the truck engine hissing, like steam and hissing. And I could see smoke. And I knew that any minute, because I could smell the diesel fuel everywhere, I knew that it could burst from the flames at any time. And so I began quickly to try to free him by doing everything I could to bend that steering wheel back, but it's made of a very strong metal. I couldn't do it. And I tried and tried to pull it back, and finally someone came and peeked in the top, climbed up over the top, and said, um, what can I do to help you? And I said, we need a saw. We need a hacksaw, a metal saw. The only way we're going to be able to get him out is cut this steering wheel off. They had to have to cut him out. Then we could at least bend it after we got the cut through. So the man said, let me go look. He went and he came back with a hacksaw. Well, I began to cut and cut and cut. But after I got about halfway through, because it was very hard steel, I, I started seeing white light. I started passing out. Why? Because I physically was not prepared to do that. I, I was not ready. I could not persevere through this rescue operation. I was so mad at myself for not being stronger. Because I knew that this man's life was depending on me being able to do this. And it was an epiphany in my life. It changed me. People ask sometimes, why do you run hot? Where do you get the discipline to do the exercise you do, do the things you do without you know? When you go through a moment like that, now he didn't die and got him out. I actually I took a breath. I regained consciousness, I got light back in my eyes, and I breathed deep, I begged God for mercy, and I made a promise, God, I will never let my body be this weak again. And then I continued to cut, and I made it through, and could, I bent it out of the way, and pulled the man out, we pulled him out, and brought him on the side of the road. We laid him at the side of the highway, I kneeled on the side of him, and I took his hand, and he looked at me with tears in his eyes, and he said, thank you. And I told him who I was and what I am and what I believe. And I told him about Jesus and asked him if he wanted me to pray for him. In case something, we don't know what kind of internal injuries you have. He said, you don't know what's going to happen. You want to make sure that you know Jesus. He agreed. He prayed to receive Jesus as his Savior at the side of the road. But he survived. He was okay. And he made it. But I, I use it as an analogy for my life. He's talking about athletes training. Why would an athlete train? An athlete and the soldier, for that matter, they train so that they are prepared and they will persevere when it's needed most. And just like I did not have what it takes, I see ministers all the time that when I put pressure on them to do something, they pull back. I get called in all the time by pastors around this city because they're scheduled, they hit. They had to preach four times that week and they just couldn't handle it. So they call me in the last minute. I often get called in within 24 hours because they know I'm like the only minister in the nation that is ready. And so seriously, I get called often. I'm like the pinch hitter, it's called in, in American baseball. I'm the guy they call when there's, there's nobody, we're in a pinch and we don't have anyone else, call Stephen. And they know I've never, if a message comes out, I've never said, oh, I don't feel ready. Why? Because I'm ready. I'm ready right now. I have 8,000 outlines in my iPhone. 
I'm ready. I'm ready to teach a seminary right now. Let's get started. Let's do it. Ready to go. So there's always a message. Why? Because I almost couldn't save a man from a burning truck. God uses things to show you you've got to be ready. And I started, in every realm of my life, I started making sure that I would be ready. I started thinking, what if it had been my children pinned in a vehicle? Or my wife or something? Perseverance. Perseverance. You might not want to hear this tonight. I don't care. I like it. It's a learned skill. You're going to have to decide to do this. We need to focus our spiritual energy on enduring this life to the end, as I said. Look at this passage. Finish the race the race, and complete the task. Acts 20, 22. Look what Paul says. And now, compelled by the Spirit. <laughs> I'm compelled by the Spirit. Compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. Not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. God has given every single one of us a task. We all have a race to run. Whether we accept it or not, you have a race to run. You have a task to accomplish. And you need to be able to persevere. If only I may finish the race, he said, and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. I'm not saying you even know the race path completely, because no one knows it completely. But you still have to run. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Paul saw himself as an athlete of the faith, and a runner in a race to the end. He wanted to pass this passion on to Timothy and to us today right here. Let's go to the third one. This is the last one, then we're going to pray. Number three, we are farmers. 2 Timothy 2, six says the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crop. So this is in continuation with the other two. First the soldier then the athlete, and now the farmer. And as we reflect on it, Paul's third comparison is that of a farmer. We see the analogy of farming, seed time and harvest, sowing and reaping throughout the entirety of the Bible. God created the world with certain absolutes, and reciprocity is one of the most important for us to understand. I said earlier, it's like gravity when we took up the offering. Don't, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows, the Bible says. It's a fact. That's the way it is. And we see this in the realms of a farmer. And let's now see how this applies to our faith. Paul wanted his disciples to grasp the need to think like a farmer when it came to the work of the ministry. And although there are many more, we consider two scriptural aspects of this comparison. Number one, the seed is the word. We know this from the parable of the sower. Farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. And it was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plant. Still, other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. See, we plant the words that we receive from God. He provides seed for the sower, like it says in 2 Corinthians 9. And now he who supplied, supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also in, uh, supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. So we are given revelation. We are given messages. We are given teachings, ideas. Revelations from God that are seeds we carry. If we are farmers, like Paul is saying we are, we need to plant those seeds. And we plant those seeds by preaching the messages we have. It does not always have to be behind a pulpit. It could be at the coffee shop. It could be at the lunch counter. It could be wherever you are. Second thing I see here is that patience is the key to being a good farmer. Look what it says in James chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. Be patient. Then, brothers, until the Lord's coming, see how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't crumble against each other, brothers, 
or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Now this is interesting as we consider the scripture in light of a farmer and it's saying about ministry that we need to be patient. And it's interesting that impatience in the works that we do will often cause us to grumble against each other. One of the main reasons why I see division in ministry realms, in, even between missionaries and the works that we have in different places, is because they don't feel productive enough. And that's one of the biggest things also that has taken missionaries out of the running. Because they want to see a harvest sooner than it is deserved. And they grow weary because they don't see the fruit they want to see. And so therefore they quit what they were doing and it's like the farmer who would plant seed in the ground in the beginning of the seed planting time. They plant the seed, they fertilize and water it, they look at it in the field, they go back to their house, go to sleep and wake up the next morning, one day later, and come back and look at the field and curse it for its lack of productivity. <laughs> you stupid ground. I'm the worst farmer in the world because there's no fruit. Well, you know, that would be obviously an idiot that would go out and look at the ground and think in a day it should be there. A farmer does not do, a real farmer does not do, a farmer knows, it says it. He knows, he waits for the land to yield its valuable crop. He's waiting for the land to do what it has to do. His job is only to put the seed in there. He puts the seed in, he covers it up, he plants the fields, he's taking his ease, he just kind of wanders around with a little, you know, the, the uh, piece of straw hanging out of his mouth with his straw hat and his overalls, he just... Now that's an American perspective of a farmer. But he goes out and he just looks at the fields. He's not impatient. He don't care. He knows it'll come when it's ready to come. Because he knows from experience. That's why not many missionaries stay long-term or ministers stay long-term is because they have this pipe dream of an idea that they would become a missionary and plant a church and have a thousand members in six months and then be validated and vindicated and be able to write newsletters and take pictures and show everybody. And this is so much of a pressure on them that they actually go and pull alongside of other ministries that have been there for 15 years and have actually waited for the harvest and take pictures with their harvest and send it back and say, look what we're doing for Jesus, taking the credit of the people. Why? Because they're under the pressure of performance to think that you owe productivity to someone. You don't. You don't. A little while ago, I wrote a letter uh, uh, to Fran Sal telling her that. She's there in the field. And, and she's, she's coming from the mentality of having been a professional. You understand? Fran Sal's our missionary. We're going to stand behind her. But she was a nurse. She worked hours and got paid for those hours. She works, she gets paid. She does something with her hands and produces something. Well, that's all gone now. Now she's a missionary. <laughs> and I had to write her and tell her, look, look, she, because I could tell me already within the first couple of weeks, it's already bothering her that I, I, she doesn't feel useful. She's just building relationships, but she, well, I, and I wrote her and I said, look, you live in the world of faith now. You're a former. You're planting seed. You might not see fruit for 10 years in your ministry. I didn't. I was basically a loner and, and a renegade floating around for 10 years in full-time ministry, not making any disciples, just taking other people's credit and standing in works that were done by others and acting like it was mine. And it wasn't. I didn't plant a church until after 10 years of full-time ministry to really see the growth of the church. Because it's like farming. It's not overnight. And you see people, sometimes you see these pastors, they're young, and you think, how can that young Joel Osteen have that church of 15,000 members? Because of his daddy, who was there for 45 years, raising that church. There are no churches come up overnight. If they do come up overnight, they're a disaster, and you don't want anything to do with them. It takes time. It takes time. Patience. It's so important that we be patient. And I found that many ministers and believers fail to see a true harvest in their labors for Christ because they simply lose patience. It can be easy to feel frustrated when we do not see a quick return for our efforts. What does the Bible say? Don't grow weary in well-doing. Keep doing it. We were talking about Jeremiah today, Johanna and I. Johanna reads the one-year Bible in Spanish and records it and posts it on Facebook like I do in English. 
So it's fun to talk to her because we both are immersed in the lives of miserable people like Jeremiah <laughs> and Job and you know these prophets and gosh when we look at each other we, we look at each other and we say how about the Bible reading? Yeah. We feel the weight of it because we have to read it dramatically too which makes it even worse. <laughs> out loud and record it so we're living the emotions of those people. Poor Jeremiah, absolutely no fruit at all, no rewards, no validation, no vindication, rejection from everybody. Every word he gave that was valid caused him to be imprisoned and beaten and locked up, chained in the courtyard, chained in a house, thrown into a muddy cistern. That was his reward for doing what God called him to do. Everybody he prophesied to ignored him and did the opposite thing. Everybody turned their back on him and walked away from him. What a miserable ministry. So you think Jeremiah had no reward? He has a reward, but it's an eternal reward. Sometimes your harvest, there are missionaries who live their whole lives and never see any fruit at all, and they were only there to plant seeds. And somebody else came along. Think about the missionaries in, that we saw the films of in our program that died before anything happened, but it was the people who came after them, after they died as martyrs, that saw the harvest. That takes patience. Have to be patient. I was talking earlier about the church. I planted several churches, numbers of works that absolutely failed and did nothing. They, I had them for a while, and it looked like they were taken off, and I was excited, but it turned out those people didn't have a clue. They were not interested in the long-term growth of the kingdom of God. They just like the idea that they had a meeting together with me. And I, I, I can think of all, every single one of those groups I have burnt into my mind. Every face of the people who pledged allegiance to me. And as soon as some roughness came along and it just got uncomfortable for them, they turned on me like that. Rejected me in an instant. Suddenly, I was the unpopular one. They don't want anything. I, I had them, groups, whole groups growing around a table, meeting weekly with me. Felt like, praise God, show up at the door, not, no, we're not interested, we're with the Jehovah's Witness now. I'm, I'm lost groups like that. You feel like, like a skunk that needs a bath when that happens to you. You go in miserable, but you need to endure. Look at these three things that, we, that we're covering. We saw these, we're soldiers, that's preparedness, you gotta be prepared. We're athletes, that's perseverance. You don't quit. You train for the duration. You run the marathon, not the sprint. We're farmers, that's patience. This is what I believe Paul was trying to get into the mind of Timothy. I think he was trying to tell him, look, you're going to need to stay consistent and continue to do the work. And in writing, in the same letter, if you read at the end of that passage, which we're not going into right now, Paul was writing about all the people that turned on him. This one forsook me. This one went back to the world. This one did that. This one did me harm. Watch out for them. May the Lord reward them for what they did to me. And he's going on and on. Hurts and difficulties and trials. Well, you know what? You don't like that? Then well, you're in the wrong business if you're going to work in the kingdom. Because that's the Jesus business. I wish I could paint a pretty picture for you and tell you that you're going to stand on a stage with lights shining on you and have thousands of members surrounding you and a huge salary and a church car and a big house and a mansion in Holland Village where they keep you in an air-conditioned uh, crypt over there. No, it's not like that. It may, one time, and you may get to that eventually, but that's not how it works. It's fidelity serving the Lord for years and years and years with a possibility of no reward at all. Are you willing to do that? I see that's counting the cost. I'm willing to do it, have been willing to do it for years. But as I said, 10 years, I didn't even make disciples. And after 10 years, at least I started making disciples. Then planting churches, then raising people. Now you're meeting disciples after 30 years of ministry that are finally doing something. Pedro Vargas. Myra Fernandez coming in to help, got alongside her, encouraged her to continue to do the things that she's doing. Different people in different nations, training, helping, making an influence on them that causes them to say, you know what, I want to serve the Lord too. Well, the information that I can pass to them is much like what Paul is telling Timothy. Stay faithful, be prepared, persevere, and be patient. Amen? Why don't we pray? I want us to stand to our feet in honor of the Lord's presence.
Jesus, we love you. Lord, on earth, you never promised us a rose garden. The contrary, you say in the scripture through your apostle Paul that all those that live a godly life in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. If you're really living by God's standards, if you're really taking up the cross and really doing what God's called you to do, there's going to be difficult times. There's going to be what you might call failures, but they're not. Like Thomas Edison said, they're lessons on how not to make a light bulb. They're lessons about the character of the human heart, the nature of individuals. They're lessons that teach us how to see what's inside of people and start to discern properly. Stop guessing about things and know by the Spirit, know from experience. And soon we'll be able to differentiate between what we know is going to be a long-term relationship and what's not going to last. I don't invest in relationships that I know are going to be here today and gone tomorrow. I look for the people that are going to be in it for the long haul. To them I will give my life and service. But we need to be prepared. We need to be willing to persevere. now in a position after all these years that I know I'll be able to endure if God gives me revival, if God causes an explosive revival to take place wherever I am, I'm not afraid of it. I'm not afraid of the workload and what I'll have to do. It doesn't frighten me in the least. Why? Because I'm prepared. I'm ready to endure because I knew what it was like to not be ready and almost have a man lose his life because I was weak. Analogously looking at that, I knew that if I were ever put in a position to have to do something, I needed to be ready. It wasn't long after that, about a year and a half after that event, that that hurricane hit the city in Acapulco. And I had to be on call immediately to serve the community. And because I was ready to go without stopping, I was healthy, I was ready to run, I was able to do so many things that open doors for hundreds of people to receive Jesus. Get ready. Opportunities are coming. Get ready. Don't look at what you think is failure and say that it was all for nothing. Oh no, it was for something. We could have said that about the life of Jesus. What a waste that Jesus had to die. It was all for nothing. No, it was the very beginning of what mattered most. Even our deaths are life-giving when we put our lives in the hands of Jesus. Lord, we trust you. We commit to the work that you've called us to do. And we will stay focused on you. We will set our hearts on you. We will look toward Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We trust you, Lord, even if things don't seem like they're working know we're going to make it. And even if everyone walks away, though none go with me, I still will follow. One thing I know about ministry is that one day you can have a full house and the very next service have an empty house. But what are you going to do? Will you remain faithful? You may have to go to another village sometimes. You may have to transition to a different place. Don't stop doing what God called you to do. Keep going. Keep going. Because in the process, you're getting prepared for a great future. You're getting prepared. It's all schooling. It's all training. It's like the soldier. You're being made ready. Like the athlete, you're learning endurance. Just trust him. Just trust him. Lord, whoever 
Lord, we have a heavy heart tonight concerning these issues. I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would meet their needs, that you would lift them up and encourage them. Give back to them the joy of their salvation. Ministry is not always fun and games. Life in the kingdom is not always a festival or a party. We're going to go through difficulties and trials at times. But what separates the men from the boys, so to speak, are these characteristics that we've just seen in this message. The ones that make it are the ones that are prepared, like the wise virgins. The ones that make it are the ones who persevere, like the one that is trained for endurance. No matter what, he's going to make it. Those that make it are the ones that are like the farmer. Patient. Be patient. Be patient. Just trust him. Just trust him. Just stay in his presence all the time. Just keep going back into the presence of the Lord.
You're always at rest. You're always at peace. And every time I come into your presence with all of my perplexing problems and enigmatic uh, dilemmas that I'm going through, you always sigh and smile and say, Stephen, just calm down. Everything's going to be okay. You always are an anchor of hope and peace. You always are a place of rest. And the only time I ever suffer is when I fail to check in with you. So I hide myself in the sanctuary. I hide myself in your presence at all times. Teach us, Lord. Teach us to be prepared. Teach us to persevere. Teach us to be patient. something from the message tonight. Good, good and blessed. Blessed to know it. We have a lot of work to do for Jesus. It's only just begun. Get ready. Get ready. Be prepared all the time. Do everything you can to prepare yourself. You know how you prepare yourself? You do functions of the church. You do what God's called you to do. Keep going. Keep visiting. Keep teaching. Keep sharing with your friends. Consistently, again and again and again. If God's called you to aid people who are in need, keep doing it. Don't stop. Keep doing it. Whatever He's put on your heart to do, just keep doing that until He tells you to stop. Don't stop because you feel like you should stop. It's the worst mistake you'll ever make. Stop when God stops you. I have never had God stop me from preaching the gospel. In 30 years, as long as I'm doing it, I've had to redirect and do different things. In some villages that won't receive me, I have to go to another village, and it's usually not as I expected it to turn out, but God always, always wants me onward and upward. Always moving forward. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Well, may the Lord bless and keep you. I pray for His protection to be over you, for His wisdom to be upon you, for His strength and His wisdom to be with you at all times. Bless us all tonight. Let us carry forth from this place the fragrance of heaven. Let our bodies be stained with eternity tonight. Give us sweet dreams and rest for our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you. See you this coming Sunday.